OK, the next item of business is a Stage 1 debate on Motion 6428 in the name of Mary McAllen on Hunting with Dogs Scotland Bill. Uh, I'd invite members who wish to participate in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Mary McAllen to speak to and move the motion. Uh, Minister, for around nine minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> I'm very pleased to open this debate on the general principles of the Hunting with Dogs Scotland Bill. And I want to give my thanks initially to the Rural Affairs and Natural Environment Committee for their considered scrutiny of the bill and to all those who gave extensive evidence at stage one. Presiding officer, it has been 20 years since the Scottish Parliament passed the Protection of Wild Mammals Scotland Act. In doing so, we became the first part of the UK to ban the use of dogs to chase and kill wild mammals for sport. As a country, it was at that point that we decided it was unacceptable and unlawful. Unfortunately, this legislation has not proven to be as robust and effective as was intended. Indeed, in my own legal training, I actually studied this bill for its deficiencies and legal uncertainty. Now, bringing forward the Hunting with Dogs bill, I intend to draw a line in the sand and to finish the work that was started 20 years ago. Concerns about the current legislation led the Scottish Government to ask Lord Bonamy to review and report on whether it was achieving its intended purpose. He came to two main conclusions, namely, first, that there were deficiencies in the drafting of the bill, and secondly, that there is reason to believe that that was leading to instances of illegal hunting. In this regard, he said, and I quote, there are aspects and features of the legislation which complicate unduly the detection, investigation and prosecution of alleged offences. And secondly, that there may be occasions when hunting, which does not fall within one of the exceptions, does take place and that the grounds for that suspicion should be addressed. Importantly, Lord Bonamy noted that despite the majority of fox control being undertaken without dogs, he said it appears that in general 20% or more of foxes disturbed by hunts are killed by hounds. This bill therefore takes as its starting point the need to address issues identified by Lord Bonamy. We have corrected deficiencies of the past, we have worked to prevent future deficiencies from opening and we have done all of that in pursuit of the highest possible animal welfare standards. However, as we seek to tackle illegal hunting, we must be clear about the need for farmers, land managers, conservationists and environmental groups to continue having access to legitimate and legal control methods to protect livestock and ground nesting birds, to manage deer, to tackle invasive species. And bearing in mind, please, Scotland also used dogs to detect evidence of wildlife crime. All of these are legitimate purposes for which dogs are used in our rural nation. The bill has been designed to balance the safe, considerate and appropriate use of dogs in permitted circumstances with the need to stop illegal hunting. And where there is suspicion of illegal activity, this bill will make it easier for the police and the Crown Office to detect, investigate and prosecute. Presiding officer, the provisions in this bill... Yes, happy to. Thank you. I am most grateful to the work the Minister has done in meeting with me and representatives of the Scottish Gamekeepers Association. Could I ask, does the Minister accept that, so far as their work is concerned, and their members and the PACS associations in using dogs to uh, control foxes, that there have been few, if any, complaints about that aspect of the work? Uh, and will the Minister confirm that the licensing regime uh, is one that, that will be flexible and will allow this good work to continue without unreasonable impediment, cost or complication. Minister. Um, Presiding officer, thanks uh, Fergus Ewing for the question and indeed I have met with him, I have met with the Scottish Gamekeepers Association as I have met with interested bodies across the spectrum here. There is evidence that the bill, um, as it stood, was not operating uh, appropriately. There is evidence of that as regards mounted hunts and as regards foot packs. Um, I think there were instances, for example, where FLS had concerns and indeed the League Against Cruel Sports have, um, have evidence where they think that uh, the rules were being contravened. As regards the licence, I'll come on, I think we'll hear a lot about that today. Um, for my opinion, the licence is an exception to an exception. It is to be available in exceptional circumstances, but it has to be available owing to some of what um, Bonamy uh, identified about. Yes, happy to. Graham Day. Thank the Minister for that. The um, licensing regime that she touched on to allow for the use of more than two dogs in specific circumstances is absolutely essential. I'm sure she would agree with that. In areas like the one that I represent, 
uh, if we're to protect uh, endangered ground nests and barns as well as livestock. But it's equally imperative, though, that the scheme is workable in practice. So to that end, can I seek at this point an undertaking from the Minister uh, that it will have direct input to its creation from land managers? I'm thinking specifically about gamekeepers here, noting the very constructive way in which the Scottish Gamekeepers Association have engaged on this particular point. Minister, and give you some of that time back. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And yes, I'm happy to give that undertaking because it's been important to me from the start, and it continues to be important, that those who are affected by the legislation that we would seek to pass are engaged in the development of it. Um, stakeholders have been very thoroughly engaged up until this point. They will continue to be as the, the guidance which will accompany the bill is developed. And equally, I think at committee, um, Nature Scott said that they would continue to work with uh, stakeholders once the guidance is in place to make sure, and I think their quote is that it does as it says uh, on the tin. Presiding officer, if I can return to my um, remarks, the provisions in this bill are the result of many years of work, Lord Bonamy's review, the widespread engagement that I have mentioned um, with land management and animal welfare stakeholders, and indeed to public consultations. Uh, and whilst the bill broadly replicates the provisions of the 2002 Act, it makes certain important modifications, which I'll try to uh, outline quickly just now. Firstly, the bill addresses the concerns with the language of the Act by unambiguously setting out the purposes for which dogs can be used. The bill also introduces a two-dog limit for that lawful activity of searching for and stalking and flushing wild animals. I'll take one more. Yep, thank you. Rachel Hamilton. Does the Minister recognise that Lord Bonamy has said that using two dogs could seriously compromise effective pest control? Yep. Minister. Yes, I do acknowledge that. And I also acknowledge Lord Bonamy's comments where he said, and I, I'm not quoting because I don't have it in front of me, but the addition of the licensing scheme was what made the two dog limit workable. And he said that they worked together. And he said that actually keeping the licensing scheme restricted was also a good idea. So I hope the member, as other members, will recognise that the Scottish Government, in introducing the two-dog limit, plus I'm still answering the point from your colleague, um, the two-dog limit plus the licensing scheme together represent the finest possible balance between these competing interests. Certainly, Carson. I thank you for, for taking the intervention. But on that point, the, the licensing is absolutely critical to whether this bill is going to fulfil uh, what it sets out to achieve. So why is it? That in your response to the committee, you suggested it's not until after this bill may be passed that you actually lay the information laying out what that licensing scheme might be. Through the chair, please, Mr. Carson, Minister. Presiding officer, um, a member of Finlay Carson's tenure would surely understand that uh, the government cannot produce guidance which accompanies the bill until they know the final form of the bill. So we are we are committed to continuing to engaging with stakeholders through the development of the legislation. The legislation sets out the framework for the licensing scheme. The guidance will accompany it. Stakeholders will be involved. But I can't know the form of the bill until it's passed at stage three. Um, but I'll continue trying to make some progress now, presiding officer. Um, and I will do that with reference to some points from the committee report. Um, firstly, I'm very pleased that the committee agreed with the general principles of the bill. Their report raised a number of important points, which I've addressed in my written remarks, and I won't rehearse them here. Um, but I just wanted to touch on the licensing scheme. I'm clear it's an exception to an exception. It must be construed narrowly and available only where other options are not available. However, I'm equally clear that when farmers, land managers, environmental groups, when they find themselves in those very circumstances, the scheme must be available, it must be workable, and it must be sensible. And so me and my officials and Nature Scott will continue to engage with stakeholders throughout the passage of the bill and during the implementation phase to develop and to refine the scheme. I'd also, in the time I have left, just like to briefly mention the issue of rough shooting. Uh, presiding officer, these have been raised with me during the latter stages of stage one. Um, and while I have tried to give a definitive view on the treatment of rough shoots when asked, it's soon become clear to me that people have very different views on what actually constitutes a rough shoot. And I think that is inherent in the name. It's a loose and informal term. Um, so my officials and I have been working, particularly since I appeared at committee, to better understand the various permutations of a rough shoot and how they are treated under the bill. And for today's purposes, I can say that it's clear there are circumstances where what's regarded as a rough shoot could operate within the bill. Um, for example, where one person uses their own two dogs to flush their own quarry, um, not working in proximate or, or with others in pursuit of the same quarry that, uh, and not allowing other dogs to join with them. However, there are activities that have been put to me as rough shooting, 
that would not be permissible under the bill. For example, a gamekeeper using five dogs to flush wild mammals to be shot by paying uh, customers. Um, but it's a broad term and it's impossible to treat it singularly. So I will listen to uh, views that are shared on that today and I'll keep working with members in advance of stage two. Um, but just by way of conclusion, I was very pleased to hear Lord Bonamy's comments during his committee session, where he says that he considers this bill to be a very well-crafted piece of legislation which solves the problem of the loose and variable use of language and should be a great incentive for better enforcement of the law. I very much look forward to hearing uh, members' contributions today. I will be listening closely and with that I move that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Hunting with Dogs Scotland Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Minister. Before inviting the next speaker, could I give a gentle encouragement to those who have not already pressed their buttons but do want to speak in the debate uh, to do so now. Um, and I call on uh, Finlay Carson on behalf of the Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Committee. Around eight minutes, Mr Carson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As convener of the Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Committee, I am pleased to speak to the Committee Stage 1 report on Hunting with Dogs Scotland Bill today. Allow me to begin by thanking everyone who was involved in the inquiry, particularly my clerks, Spice and all individuals and organisations who provided evidence, allowing us to draw upon a wealth of quality evidence and expertise. The Government states that this bill is intended to address deficiencies in the Protection of Wild Mammals Scotland Act 2002, which may have contributed to the continuation of illegal hunting practices in Scotland. The bill attempts to address some ambiguities in the language used. It also introduces a two-dog limit for hunting above ground and a one-dog limit below ground. It provides for a licensing scheme to facilitate exceptions to some of those limits and prohibits activities known as trail hunting. The committee notes these intentions and recognises the bill as an attempt to strike a balance between pursuing the highest possible standards in animal welfare while also lowering, uh, allowing for the legitimate control of wild mammals in our rural communities. Although the committee supported the general principles of the bill, there were a number of concerns raised by various stakeholders which we reflected in our report. Therefore, I welcome on behalf of the committee the Government's response which sets out its own views on those concerns. In addition, I appreciate the response being provided in good time to allow all members to reflect on both our report and the response ahead of this debate. Uh, section 1 and 2 creates the offence of hunting using a dog if none of the exceptions set out in the later sections apply. The revised language and definition used in the Bill lead on from the Lord Bonamy Review of 2002, uh, undertaken in 2016. Uh, in evidence, the committee, uh, Lord Bonham, uh, Bonamy stated that he regarded this Bill as a very well-crafted piece of legislation and that it makes everything more, uh, much clearer and simpler which it in itself should be a great incentive for better enforcement of the law. Uh, Lord Bonamy also supported the removal of the word deliberately from the definition of hunting, but the committee also noted the concerns of some stakeholders who called, called for the bill to introduce clearer definitions of terms such as hunting, searching and coursing. It is vital that this bill does not repeat the problems of uh, ambiguous language which was identified in the 2002 Act, and we ask for further information on the definition of hunting to reassure us that these terms do not need to be further defined. In our response, the Minister reiterated her position that hunting should encompass, to quote, the natural meaning of the word, and argued that to expand the term would be, and quoting again, offering scope for people to argue that some specific conduct which would naturally uh, be understood as hunting falls out with the definition. Moving on to the issues of the defin definition of a wild mammal, which has been expanded to include rabbits, but not rats, mice or animals living under temporary or human control. And the committee noted that the inclusion of rabbits in the definition is intended to address concerns that hunting rabbits is used as a cover for hair coursing, as well as to prevent rabbits from being chased and killed by dogs. There was disagreement among stakeholders on the animal welfare benefits of including rabbits, with some arguing that a ban on using dogs to hunt rabbits is not the most effective way to tackle hair coursing. In our report, we asked for further information from the government on how to use, uh, dogs are used to control rabbits in Scotland and to clarify what alternative methods of preventing hair coursing have been considered. I certainly can. Christine Graham. J just referring to the committee's report, it's an excellent report, by the way. I know that both Police Scotland welcomed the inclusion of rabbits in there because it cannot be used as subterfuge for hair coursing, and the PF's office also said it was a useful inclusion in the bill. Do you agree? 
Finley Carson. Uh, uh, well, the, the committee was undecided on that, uh, and I'm not going to give my personal opinion as, as the convener could be providing this uh, contribution as the convener of the committee. Uh, uh, Do you agree these were the Christine quotes? Graham. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear your question. Do you agree Christine that Graham. these were the quotes from your report? These are quotes, yes. Uh, in their response, the Minister stated the bill would address the animal welfare anomaly, anomaly, anomaly whereby it is an offence to use dogs to chase and kill hares and most wild animals, mammals, but not to chase and kill rabbits. The bill provides for exceptions to the offence of hunting a wild mammal using a dog, and these are in sections 3 and 5, to prevent serious damage to livestock, woodland or crops, and prevent the spread of disease and protect human health. In section 6, for falconry, game shooting and deer stalking, and in section 7, for environmental benefits such as preserving a particular species or biodiversity more broadly. These exceptions can only be used for certain purposes and so long as specified conditions are met. One condition in the exceptions is the use of a bird of prey to kill a wild mammal instead of the use of guns. The Animal Welfare uh, Commission uh, did question in evidence why this exception was included and recommended its removal from the bill. And the Minister confirmed that the use of a bird of prey as one of the two permitted methods of killing a, a wild mammal was to include instances where a falconer is employed to use dogs to flush to a waiting bird of prey. In section 3, uh, it is the first exception and introduces a two-dog limit for the purpose of controlling wild, mammal, wild mammals above ground to prevent serious damage to livestock, woodland or crops. And the committee recognised the impact and the consequences of serious damage caused by wild mammals. Uh, the committee also noted the different views of stakeholders on the impact of the two-dog limit on animal welfare. Some considered this would still allow for the flushing of mammals from cover whilst reducing the likelihood of a dog handler losing control over a pack. However, uh, there were concerns that this would prevent the effective flushing of animals and prolong distress for both wild mammal and dog. Some of the committees shared these concerns and a report asked the government to address them in a workable way through the proposed licensing scheme. Section 4 sets out the proposal for a licensing scheme and an exemption to the exemption to permit the use of more than two dogs for a maximum of 14 days. The licensing scheme is set to be administered by Nature Scott. While a licensing scheme could be the means to address the stakeholders' concerns about the impact of the two-dog limit, the committee heard different expectations among stakeholders on how the licensing scheme would work in practice, different expectations partly as a result of a lack of clarity around the licensing scheme. The committee welcomed the commitment by the government and Nature Scott to engage with stakeholders around the design of the licensing scheme and to provide further information on the scheme's development. And the Minister set out her intention to continue to engage with stakeholders uh, after today's decision and if the general principles uh, are agreed to. But uh, given the uh, significant importance of the licensing scheme, as a convener of the committee, I would warmly welcome a commitment to give a verbal update to the committee prior to consideration of stage two amendments. It may also be the case that any movement on this and other contentious areas in the government pro, uh, position may require the committee to take additional evidence before the conclusion of the bill process. A particular concern among some stakeholders in which we sought the government's view on was the requirement for a licence to be valid for up to 14 days. And I thank the Minister for her response on this issue and for confirming her continued engagement with stakeholders and her openness to consider alternative approaches should appropriate arguments be made to why 14 days would not be a su sufficient period. Section 5 provides an exception for the use of one dog below ground to flush fox or mink. It is the Government's view that the use of one dog below ground strikes a balance between predation control and animal welfare. However, animal welfare stakeholders have concerns that even the use of one dog below ground raises animal welfare issues. We also heard about how the exception would work in practice as the conditions required verbal or audio, uh, audible commands by the dog handlers. But the National Working Terrors Federation position is that flushing is the most effective when dog handlers work in silence. Given this evidence, the committee was not clear on how the exception would maintain the highest animal welfare standards or work in practice. The Minister's response reiterates the Government's position and provides some helpful clarification around, around how the exception would work. I welcome her commitment to listen carefully to what is said today about this exception and to give full consideration to her views and feedback before Stage 2 proceedings. 
Section 6 provides an exception for the use of up to two dogs for falconry game uh, shooting and deer stalking. And the main issue raised in relation to this was raised by some stakeholders about how the exception for game and rough shooting would you work do in practice. To conclude now, Mr. Uh, in conclusion, the Minister's response gave some uh, detail. Uh, however, there is some uh, 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 concerns that uh, there is there's more questions to be answered uh, from a response. Uh, the, uh, the response does little to provide clarity around rough shoots and cr creates more questions. President officer, uh, we we'll look forward to more engagement uh, as we go through this process and the committee uh, will continue to highlight the, 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 the concerns of the stakeholders. Uh, I look forward to hearing members' contributions today in this debate, some of which, if the bill does progress at decision time, I expect the committee to explore in more detail at stage two. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kirshner. Unfortunately, we do not have um, really much time in hand, so I am going to have to keep uh, members to their speaking allocations. Uh, could I also remind members that when you make an intervention, you will need to then repress your button if you are looking to speak later in the debate. And with that, I call Rachel Hamilton for uh, up to seven minutes. Ms. Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am glad you reminded me of that. Uh, since the election of the sixth Scottish Parliament, this chamber has seen over 200 debates, and in that time, I can think of only two that have exclusively focused on rural affairs. I welcome this exceedingly rare opportunity to discuss a matter that relates to our rural communities in this setting. However, I would add that discussing these matters are so infrequent, it is indicative of a government that does not understand that 98% of this country is classified as rural, 1% of debates for 98% of Scotland. That lack of understanding presiding officer, I am afraid is plainly evident in this bill. After Lord Bonamy published his review of ex existing legislation on hunting with dogs, ministers were right to look at ways of addressing the weaknesses highlighted, but they have done so in a manner that ignores both the findings of Bonamy's review and the burden of evidence provided by stakeholders. And I want to address some of those key areas these stakeholders have described as impractical, unworkable and damaging. For those who have taken an interest in this bill, I know animal welfare will be a key uh, part of that interest. And in that context, welfare concerns of, uh, of the predator, the animals, wildlife under predation that are being protected. And in this context, dogs. Earlier this month, we were all alarmed to hear of the perilous position Capicale find themselves. Mm -hmm. It is the same story for other ground nesting birds, such as the curlew. We must recognise that the failure to manage predators has real-life consequences, not just for kept animals, but for our fledgling, fledgling wildlife too. And does the minister really want to be the minister who lost the capicale or the curlew? Mm. The reality of this bill is that is what is at stake here. Mm -hmm. By passing this bill in its current form, we risk removing the vital tool of predator control from our toolbox for protecting and enhancing Scotland's biodiversity. The SCA note that if dogs are continued to be used effectively in rough shooting or other pest control contexts, more than two dogs will be needed and must therefore be licensed under the bill. The former director of the League Against Cruel Sports stated that gun packs have realised that pairs of dogs are utterly useless in flushing to guns whilst Lord Bonamy himself noted that imposing such a restriction could seriously compromise effective pest control in the country, especially on rough or covered terrain. And given the implications of imposing a two-dog limit, it is absolutely imperative that the licensing system is fair and workable, and I acknowledge that the Minister has, has said that in her response. The Bill's viability, as Bonamy notes, rests on this, mm -hmm. yet, as currently drafted, there is an overwhelming burden of evidence from organisations like BASC, CSA, the NFUS and many more that suggests that this is neither fair, practical or remotely workable. There is a typical lack of detail, but wh where the detail is provided, it makes for worrying reading. Mm -hmm. The 14-day licence, for example, is ill thought through and unevidenced. As the SCA point out, most land managers that use packs to flush would do so two to three times a year at reg regular intervals in conjunction with other methods. To limit each licence to a 14-day period is unworkable unless applicants can be granted multiple licences, which is, of course, bureaucratic and unnecessary. And farmers need the flexibility to use their licence allowance as is most appropriate to them. The current plan would completely ignore this need. There are many more unanswered questions about the licensing scheme. 
As the Minister has already stated in the Rain Committee, we simply cannot wait until a farmer's livestock has been killed by a fox before they have enough evidence to apply for the licence. This begs the question, what evidence does an applicant need to provide in order to, provide, uh, to obtain a licence? We don't know. What is the distinction between flushing foxes to protect livestock or to protect the environment? No answer. And how does the scheme deal with landscapes, uh, landscape scale wildlife management? More evidence required. There is a lot of work to be done, presiding officer, on the few areas of the licensing scheme I have discussed, but this barely scratches the surface and my time is ticking on. Turning to the inclusion of rabbits in the definition of a wild mammal, I do understand that there is the intention from the government to tackle the serious problem of hair coursing, but this must not come at the expense of effective wildlife management. Mm -hmm. There is a remedy to this that would allow rabbits to be excluded from the definition whilst ensuring that we, they could not be used as a defence for hair coursing. And I would be grateful if the Minister would discuss, uh, meet with me to discuss this um, in, in the future for perhaps future amendments. We know how damaging rabbit grazing can be to the natural environment, as well as grazing grounds that farmers need for their livestock. They can cause damage to crops, businesses and infrastructure, costing farmers and others money to repair and replace what is damaged, as well as putting a massive strain on their mental health. I'll give way to the Minister. Minister. Sir, and I'd be happy to meet with the member as I am with, with any member uh, who wants to discuss these issues. I would just ask maybe for her to reflect on whether she believes that the sentience of a rabbit means that its welfare ought to be protected and that it ought to be protected from being chased and killed by dogs in the same way that, that I, I think we would all agree a hare should. Well, I would ask the Minister if she believes that the sentience of a rat would be in the same um, category. Basque have also pointed out that inclusion of rabbits in the two-dog limit has unintended consequences for rough shooting. And I'm sure the Minister would like to touch on that in her closing remarks, given the widespread concern that this activity would become restricted rather than an exception. This afternoon, the Crofting Federation, joined pro we, we all joined a protest outside the Parliament against the proposed new agricultural bill or the lack of uh, detail within the bill for the Crofting bill. Next week, an even larger rally organised by the NFUS will be held on the same issue. Um, I don't Member have, is winding up. I don't have much time. I'm really sorry. Perhaps you could um, speak to me a, a, another time. Um, but this hunting with dogs bill is growing to, uh, growing to a large pet pile of red tape, and it's stopping people from doing their job. The very people who provide food for the country whilst working towards a sustainable future for agriculture and for Scotland's countryside, protecting crops um, and managing our natural environment and protecting wildlife, these people are all doing this, but they're needless, needlessly being penalised, presiding officer, uh, with more bu bureaucracy than ever. I see that you're making notes to me uh, just now um, for me to, to conclude. But, um, presiding officer, this is the extent of letters, even in the last week, from rural organisations who are concerned about this. I'm concerned for their mental health. I'm concerned about their livelihoods. And I hope that the SNP share those concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Hamilton. I now call Colin Smith uh, for up to six minutes, Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to echo the thanks to the, the RAIN Committee members and CLATS for all the work they've put into gathering evidence to inform its Stage 1 report and to all those who made submissions. And like the Committee, Labour is happy to support the general principles of the Bill at Stage 1. This bill is the culmination of many years of reviews, of consultations, of debate and unfortunately delays. It is time to put this matter to bed. It is time to end the cruelty of hunting with dogs once and for all. It is 20 years since the Protection of Mammals Bill was passed by this Parliament. Since then, a minority have sought to ignore both the letter and the spirit of that law, to exploit loopholes, to believe that despite the will of Parliament, despite overwhelming public opposition to hunting with dogs, it should be business as usual. For them, this bill, as it stands, will mean a continuation of that business as usual. The bill does not fully close the loopholes that exist. It merely licences them. And, President Officer, you cannot licence cruelty. You cannot believe, on the one hand, that we need to limit the number of dogs to two because that reduces the risk of dogs instinctively chasing and killing, but then, on the other hand, continue to allow the use of packs of dogs simply because 
they have a licence. Providing officer, you don't close loopholes by creating new ones. I uh, certainly will, yeah. Jim Fairley. Thanks very much to the members for taking the intervention. Do you accept the fact that land managers, farmers and those who live and work in the land have a right to be able to continue to protect their livestock and crops? Again, through the chair, but Colin Smith. They, they certainly do indeed, and, and there were numerous examples given to the committee of why that can be achieved using the limit of two dogs. So Labour will bring forward an amendment to this bill to remove licensing, to make sure two dogs actually means two dogs. And I would say this to SNP members, if you do vote against that, if you vote with Tory MSPs to keep licensing, you do vote to keep hunting with packs of dogs. And that, if I can get the time back, um, President Officer. A little bit, Mr Smith. Uh, Fergus Ewing, briefly. Uh, just, just to ask Mr Smith if, if he does not accept that in some terrain, in forestry, on uneven and difficult land, on on hill land, it is simply impossible to carry out the task with only two dogs. Colin Smith. Uh, uh, President Officer, there are numerous ways in which people can manage wildlife uh, in their area, and, and using dogs is only one of them. The very fact that the government has so far failed to actually define what a licence would be achieved by and what the criteria would be, I think, suggests that that, that will be difficult. But I, I think Fergus Ewan does give the game away that some people will seek to, to ride roughshod over the ban by using, in, using the licensing scheme for, for pretty, I have to say, uh, un, un, undefined undefined criteria. Um, I'm in the hands of the presiding officer. If I do have time to take that and have the time back. Rachel Hamilton, briefly, please. Um, thank you for that. Um, would Colin Smith um, tell us what the other alternatives are? For example, would an upland farmer in his constituency, and I'm sure you've engaged with many of them, Mr Smith, um, would, he, would they be able to put a great big fence around their uh, huge upland uh, land? Colin Smith. The reality is the bill does not ban the use of dogs. It limits the use of dogs to just two. And in evidence to the, the committee, the minister admitted that the use of packs of dogs has meant, and I quote, mammals continue to be hunted and killed by dogs in contravention of the 2002 Act. And I appreciate that the Conservative members have little interest in animal welfare issues, but the reality is that handing out a licence won't make that any less cruel if you have a pack of dogs. And those who have exploited uh, you don't have any don't, additional time. I don't, I don't have any time, but I think, I, think, I, think, I think I'm very clear what the Conservative position is on this ban. And what's really interesting, I have to say in particular, is the UK government, the UK government position at this moment in time is to have legislation in England and Wales that covers only two dogs. But it's interesting to see the different position in Scotland. Handing out a licence won't make the use of packs of dogs any less cruel, and those who have exploited the current hunting legislation will seek to exploit this flawed legislation. Many, including the government's own Animal Welfare Commission, along with animal welfare organisations such as the SSPCA, One Kind, the League Against Cruel Sports, Scottish Badgers, the World Animal Welfare Committee, already argue this bill is a compromise by allowing any dogs in the hunting of mammals. And none, presiding officer, not a single one, support a licensing scheme to allow a continuation of hunting with more than two dogs. This is not the only area that Labour believe this bill falls short. On the offence of hunting itself, the removal of the word deliberately is welcome, but the definition of hunting still focuses on searching and coursing and does not include other terms such as stalking, pursuing or flushing. We agree with it. The written submission from one kind to suggest, and I quote, the definition should be to search for, stalk, flush, chase, pursue or course. The committee in its stage one report rightly said it is vital the bill does not repeat ambiguities and definitions which were present in the 2002 Act, and the Minister herself acknowledged when she gave evidence to the committee that it could be helpful to expand on the list of specified terms, something Labour will seek to achieve at stage two. On the definition of a wild animal in the bill, Police Scotland and others supported the inclusion of rabbits, which is a material change from the previous Act, not just as a means of preventing hair coursing, but on animal welfare grounds. Rabbits are, after all, sentient creatures. So too are rats and mice, but I do note the view from the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission that some of the methods of controlling rodents are arguably even less humane than killing with dogs. Presiding officer, the sooner we outlaw many of those method methods, such as glue traps, the better. But in the meantime, Labour accepts the exclusion of rats and mice in the definition. We are, however, unconvinced by the proposal to continue to allow the use of dogs below ground to control wild animals. The provisions in the Act to limit the number of dogs to one and for that dog to somehow be controlled, which is unrealistic, appears to be a messy compromise. If it is cruel to use more than one dog, then it is cruel to use any dogs. 
It is little wonder that in its report the committee says it is not clear that, and I quote, the use of dogs at all below ground is, co is compatible with the Bill's pursuit of the highest possible animal welfare. That is because, President Officer, it is not. So if the Government do not bring forward an amendment to remove the use of dogs below ground, then Labour will do so. Uh, I do want to end on a positive note. Uh, I welcome Section 11 of the Bill, which introduces new offences for participating in trail hunting, a sport which has been created in England and Wales as a cover for hunting wild mammals after the passage of the Hunting Act 2005. One kind pointed out in their submission to the committee that by preemptively banning trail hunting in Scotland, it will prevent a repeat of that, this in Scotland. And, and the SSPC also highlighted that banning trail hunting altogether will, and I quote, eliminate any confusion by enforcement agencies of the activity taking place. President officer, there is much more in the bill that I am sure will be raised in debate, and hopefully I will come back to some of those issues in my closing comments. But in conclusion, ending hunting with packs of dogs is unfinished business. It is regrettable this bill is necessary, but it is. However, we need to get it right. Labour will work with the Government and others to help achieve that, to ensure we do not respond to existing loopholes by creating new ones, that we do not just nudge the bar towards less hunting with packs of dogs, but that we end hunting with packs of dogs and we end it once and for all. Okay, thank you, Mr Smith. I, there will be a little time for um, interventions, for time to get, be given back in, in the uh, case of interventions, but there is there's very limited time. Beatrice Wishart, uh, up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, as Deputy Convener of the RAIN Committee, I add my thanks to the Clarks, the Bill Team and SPICE for their work, and to my committee colleagues and Convener Finlay Carson. I would also like to thank all the witnesses who gave evidence to the Committee and the organisations who provided briefings. The stated aim of the Bill, which replaces the 2002 Act to hunt a wild mammal using a dog, except in limited circumstances, is to give clarity to what was intended by the original Act. The Bill seeks to manage control rather than eradicate it, which is an important part of living on the land. I want to see a workable scheme based on evidence. I note in the Law Society of Scotland briefing their concerns regarding a section in Part 133E and the condition that the wild mammal is shot dead or killed by a bird of prey as soon as reasonably possible. And they highlight that such terminology does not provide, and I quote, substantive difference from the equivalent provision under the 2002 Act, which requires the mammal to be shot dead or killed by a bird of prey once it is safe to do so. The proposed licensing scheme chimes with evidence the committee heard that in some instances more than two dogs are required to flush a mammal, wild mammal from cover for quick flushing and dispatch. The Liberal Democrats support the principle of a licensing scheme. The Scottish Government will need to address concerns about this scheme, which we share. The Minister stated that applying for a licence should be the exception, but clarity is needed from the Minister here on what will be considered an exception. A workable licensing scheme must be evidence-led and flexible. The 14 consecutive days does, not, does seem unnecessarily restrictive, and I would like the Minister to consider greater flexibility, led by the evidence that it could be 14 days across a longer period. Criteria used for the licensing scheme also needs to be looked at, as there is a lack of clarity about the details of the scheme. These criteria must be developed through engagement with stakeholders and again be based on the evidence as to what works. The Minister indicates she is willing to engage further with stakeholders on this matter, and I encourage her to do so to ensure that the licensing scheme will be both workable and practicable. It must support crofters and farmers and those who live and work on the land in their role as land managers and food producers to protect livestock and crops through necessary pest control and help combat biodiversity loss. Nature Scott will be responsible for administering the licensing scheme and this committee received assurances that it is fully resourced to cope with this additional responsibility. In scrutinising this point, it would be helpful if the Scottish Government could indicate how many licences they expect to be issued each year once the system is operational. Some stakeholders have raised concerns about the implications for rough shooting and gun dog trials, but I am pleased the Minister clarified these activities remain legal under the Bill, provided each person in attendance controls no more than two dogs, and the dogs do not form a pack. I note that the Scottish Government agrees with concerns that the Bill does not provide for the use of two dogs to search for and retrieve a wild mammal which has been injured, 
and look forward to seeing the amendment from the Scottish Government to address this point in due course. I turn now to trail hunting. The proposed preemptive ban is sensible given the view that because of the ban on hunting with more than two dogs in England and Wales, trail hunting here could be used as a cover for hunting wild mammals. Concerns were raised, however, that the two dog limit on the exception for training dogs to follow an animal-based scent could negatively impact police and emergency rescue dog training practices. The committee heard that in Police Scotland up to six dogs are trained at once. However, the Scottish Government state that it's not standard practice to release more than two dogs at any one time. So I would appreciate assurance from the Government that all emergency and rescue trainings will be covered by this exception. Presiding officer, what remains on the details to ensure the bill achieves its aims? But today, the Scottish Liberal Democrats will support the general principles of the bill. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to the open debate, and I call first uh, Karen Adam to be followed by Russell Finlay uh, for around six minutes. Ms. Adam. Thank you, presiding officer. As a member of the Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Committee, I am pleased to participate in this debate and in our deliberations. It would be true to say that the Committee has endorsed the general principles of this Bill. It would also be true to say that the evidence from stakeholders has been constructive and supportive, as from the National Farmers Union of Scotland, who have stressed the need to maintain effective, practical and pragmatic control of wild animals in the farming and crofting context and to the League Against Cruel Sports Scotland, who rightly point out the flaws in the legislation surrounding this some 20 years ago. In this bill, the inevitability surrounding the challenges posed by definitions has loomed large. The dilemma of deploying an inclusive and open-ended approach, with the potential for unintended consequences by way of extending terminology, it is a balancing act that has been successfully achieved here in this bill. Part of that balancing act is our determination to close down loopholes that might be exploited by those who wish to continue using dogs to chase and kill wild animals, whilst on the other hand recognising the need for the effective protection of livestock and wildlife from predation where there is no other option than the use of more than two dogs. The evidence to the committee from the Police and Crown Office has of course been invaluable not least with regard to hair coursing that remains a serious concern in Scotland and the inclusion of rabbits within the definition of wild mammal in the bill is part of a wider package that addresses this issue. The stakeholder and public... Yes? Rachel Hamilton. I thank the member for taking the intervention, but does the member recognise the serious damage that rabbits can do um, to land and, and biodiversity and the rest of it and crops causing livelihood issues to farmers? if not controlled properly? Karen Adam. Uh, yes, I do. I, I agree with the member in that regard, that they, they can cause damage. But as we heard on the committee, there are other ways of controlling rabbits. And we, we need to look at those other options, not necessarily hunting them down with dogs. And in Scotland, we need to be setting a standard, and the highest standard, for animal welfare. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can I ask the member if at any point during the evidence that we received, did anyone suggest there was any uh, concerns relating to uh, rabbits and animal welfare? Karen Adam, and I can give you that. Um, I don't think I need to hear evidence, or anybody needs to hear evidence, that um, hunting and killing rabbits without actual need to. Um, would it be harmful in any way? I, I, I don't quite get what. If, if you want to, you know, narrow down your question a bit as to specifically what you mean, happy to come. Yeah. Finley Carr. You know, quite simply, this bill is all about animal welfare. That's the principle of this bill. Did we hear any evidence that suggested there was any animal welfare issues relating to rabbits? Karen Adam. Um, I think we heard plenty of evidence from a lot of stakeholders, but the, the, the main premise of this bill is to tighten up legislation and to ensure that we have the highest animal welfare standards in Scotland. And I don't believe, and others agree with me, that chasing down a wild rabbit with dogs is fitting with those high standards in Scotland. 
Um, the evidence to the committee from the... Sorry, I won't read that again. Um, so this bill is part of a wider package that addresses the issue. The stakeholder and public consultation on the definition of wild mammal highlighted that those who are suspected of undertaking hair coursing and illegal activity under the 2002 Act frequently use the cover that they are legally using dogs to hunt rabbits. Presiding officer, as this is always the case, the committee deliberates, we sit here and we scrutinise, but key to enforcement is us building a greater level of public awareness of poaching and coursing as serious wildlife crime, and we must continue to build working relations, communications and share information between all agencies and organisations. As a committee, we have also recognised a, deg a degree of flexibility to meet individual contexts and circumstances. I doubt I'm not alone in recalling the submissions to us from Lord Bonamy regarding the two-dog limit that could affect predator control, not least particularly on rough and hilly ground and in extensive areas over dense cover such as conifer woodlands. One size doesn't fit all, and the addition of a licensing scheme to enable the use of more than two dogs in certain circumstances is a viable approach, as the Bill acknowledges. Following this debate, there will rightly be a series of stakeholder engagement meetings which will follow the shared wildlife management principles, providing an open platform for stakeholders to discuss and provide expertise in developing such licensing schemes. In conclusion, President Officer, there has been a profound amount of work on this proposed legislation at committee level, and my time speaking to it is, of course, limited. Having packs of dogs kill and chase animals, such as foxes, has no place in modern Scotland. The practice has been illegal for 20 years, but there are a number of loopholes that need to be addressed to end the practice once and for all, and this bill facilitates that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Adam. I now call uh, Russell Finlay to be followed by Jim Fairley again for around six minutes, Mr Finlay. Thank you, Deputy President. Mm -hmm. Officer. Um, at the outset, I should declare an interest, or perhaps it's a non-interest, despite being an urban creature who's most comfortable surrounded by concrete and fumes. I do sometimes pass through the clean air of the countryside and have even been known to visit it on occasion. And what I'm supposed to be trying to say is that I do not have anything like the knowledge of this subject as many others who are speaking today. And it's possible that not having been a countryside dweller may even be helpful, as I do not have a dog in this particular fight, so to speak. Now, let me begin by thanking Finlay Carson, my party's convener of the Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Committee, along with the other members. I know that Finlay and my equally highly respected colleague, Rachel Hamilton, have great passion for Scotland's rural communities and a real depth of knowledge. Now, having been volunteered to speak in today's debate, I realised I needed to, le to learn quickly. I have read numerous media reports and debate briefs submitted to members, and I have spent some of recess digesting the Committee's Stage 1 report on the Hunting with Dogs Scotland Bill, which is, of course, what we are dealing with this afternoon. It is evident that much work has been done, with many competing views having been expressed. And while there is some support for this legislation, all members should listen to the strong and valid concerns that have been raised by numerous organisations. These include the Scottish Countryside Alliance, which describes the bill as, and I quote, unnecessary and contrary to the evidence. They contest the apparent premise of this legislation, which is that the Protection of Wild Animals Scotland Act 2002 has somehow failed. They warn that this new bill, which is intended to replace the 2002 Act, might not improve animal welfare as is intended. According to the Scottish Countryside Alliance, it could actually have the opposite effect. Their director, Jake Swindles, said, we cannot have a situation unfold where a bill of this magnitude is waved through with potentially devastating consequences for rural Scotland and our countryside. I will, yes. Alistair Allen. I thank the member for giving way. Without trading quotes, will he also acknowledge that the committee uh, received evidence from uh, none other than Lord Bonamy, the author of the, the review in question, which, uh, say, who said rather, that the bill makes everything much clearer and simpler uh, and that it will be a great incentive for better enforcement of the law. Russell Finney, give you the time back. Indeed, Lord Bonamy did say that, and what I'm trying to illustrate is the other voices that feel, and I'll come on to this, that they have perhaps not been as heard, heard as properly as they should have been. It seems that some who oppose this legislation feel they are not being heard 
or worse, that the government's just going through the motions. It brings me to mind my recent experience on the Criminal Justice Committee when we took evidence from stakeholders in relation to what became the Fireworks and Pyrotechnic Article Scotland Act. Industry representatives with decades of experience and whose interests are served by the safe use of fireworks complained of being sidelined. They expressed frustration that their input felt more like tokenism or box ticking and that blinkered ministers had already decided what they wanted to do. We have seen similar recent criticism directed at this government's Gender Recognition Reform Bill, where women with legitimate and reasonable concerns feel they are not being heard because their views do not suit Nicola Sturgeon's agenda. So whether it is about gender reform, fireworks, hunting with dogs or any other bill, it is the job of members of this parliament to listen and to consider all views, not just pay lip service to them. And I'll give way. Jim Fairley. I'd thank the member for giving way. Could he not just acknowledge the fact that the minister has actually sta stated in her opening statement that she's going to take evidence and, and speak to stakeholders? She's accepted an intervention. She's accepted an intervention from my colleague already, who has stated that they will be informed. The decisions will be informed by dealing with stakeholders. Russell Finlay. I'm sure they will, those stakeholders will be reassured by the Minister's comments today, and let's hope uh, that indeed comes to pass. Um, another issue about today's bill which interests me relates to its enforcement, which will fall to Police Scotland. Now, we ask so much of our police officers who work gruelling shifts under immense pressure and whose numbers are at their lowest since 2008. While generally supportive of the bill, Police Scotland have raised a number of concerns which feature in the Stage 1 report. They dispute an opinion provided to the committee by the Law Society of Scotland in relation to the bill differentiating between ordinary dog walkers and those involved in the illegal act of hair coursing. Police Scotland also have raised concerns about the bill's intended outlawing of trail hunting. Now, the SNP government aimed to ban trail hunting in Scotland, even though, as I understand it, it is rarely, if ever, takes place here. And this is apparently because of a prosecution in England of trail hunting being used as a cover for illegal hunting. Police Scotland reasonably point out that just because this has happened elsewhere does not in itself justify the need for banning it here. Another concern made by the police relates to the possibility that elements of the bill might negatively impact on the training of police dogs, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that in due course. Now, returning to my main point, and in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, I hope the government does listen to these concerns, along with those from others who know what they are talking about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Finlay. I now call on Jim Fairley to be followed by Mercedes Vialba for around six minutes. Thanks very much, President Officer. And I have to say, as a member who sits on the RAIN Committee, I'm really disappointed in the tone in which the way the Tories have brought this debate, because I thought the conversations that we were having were constructive, they were looking for a balance, and that's what I hoped that today's debate would be. Unfortunately, that's not the case. So somebody with 30 years of everyday experience, and I mean quite literally everyday experience because working in sheep farming is a seven-day-a-week job. I've got lived experience as a sheep farmer shepherd, and I feel I've got a unique perspective in this chamber and that I'm able to bring that perspective of a person whose professional livelihood could have been affected by the consequences of this bill. My hope is that my views are taken as balanced, proportionate and in keeping with the aims of the bill, which are trying to find the right solutions to the loopholes while trying to allow those whose livelihoods and ways of life are affected to have comfort that the bill will be workable and how it affects each of them. Predators such as foxes killing the odd lamb is what we sheep farmers would call passing trade. It's going to happen. If you get one lamb lifted, that's the way it goes. If it happens a second time, you start to pay attention to it. So if a third lamb is lifted or killed for trinkets like ears or tails, then there's an issue in your lambing fields, and your lambing fields are going to be the larder and the toy cupboard for den over the coming season, and that is simply not sustainable for sheep farmers. It's clear that foxes can and do real damage to livestock and livelihoods and ground nesting birds. So it's important that the Parliament affirms that a certain amount of wildlife control or predator control is a necessity for land managers, farmers and conservationists, and that this is at the heart of this bill, this is what this bill intends to do. So it must be balanced against the absolute necessity to close the loopholes that allows for the obscenity of those looking to hunt foxes or animal animals with packs of dogs for sport and pleasure. Yes, we'll take the interview. Uh, I, I thank Jim Fairley for taking the intervention. Um, would 
Jim fairly accept that, that the licensing scheme should be as flexible as possible beyond a 14-day period, which gave um, landowners, land managers the ability to control predators over a longer period of time without having to consistently apply for a licensing scheme which is bureaucratic, especially during the lambing season. Jim I'll, Fairley, I'll come, thing back. I will come on to the, the, the licensing scheme in my speech. Throughout our committee discussions, I raised concerns with the potential granting of the licensing scheme for working more than two dogs and for those seeking to address predatory problems. Foxes are going to be foxes, and there's no way for farmers to determine which of the foxes that will cause their businesses harm and over what pre pre precise time period they're going to strike. So granting a 14 day license is only on the basis of a proven local issue is problematic, and I'm not convinced at this stage we have found the right balance over timings. But I am comforted and welcome the Minister's commitment to my colleague Graham Day's intervention to look at this point with land managers, helping to inform the best practice for granting the licenses. And I understand the government's position and concerns of people using the licence as a loophole. But when we are talking about walked-up hounds as opposed to ridden hounds, the desire and opportunity to use this licence to exploit or create a loophole, I believe, is as unlikely as it is desirable, undesirable for those who are using walked hounds for predator control. Now, I'm still keen for the government to explore the possibility of looking at how many guns are available, as importantly as the number of dogs used for flushing. And I raised this issue in, in committee on several occasions. If there are sufficient guns in the drive, there will be no room for foxes to escape and the guns to escape excuse me, to escape the guns and then be hunted and killed by dogs. And my final point is that we must not unintentionally criminalise rough and game shooting. At the start of my intervention, I suggested that the focus on better definition is by all means well intended. And I completely understand the government's position in trying to protect rabbits from being hunted by dogs and to close the loophole that exists for those who pursue hair, co hair coursing as a sport. But I would caution against the unintended consequences of criminalising those who quite legitimately pursue rough shooting and game shooting, and I welcome the opportunity to discuss this in depth with the Minister at a later date. I will, yep. I appreciate you taking the intervention. Could you give me one example where two dogs would be the most appropriate in terms of uh, ability to flush or animal welfare, where two dogs would be the most appropriate number of dogs? One, to one chair, situation. Carson, I'll Jim give you Fairley. one scenario then, one that I've actually used as a sheep farmer. There was a very narrow copse of woods running up about 250 metres. There were two guns either side. Two dogs went through the middle and we shot the fox at the top. I'll give you as many examples as you like, for, um, Finlay. So I feel that the points I raised today... Chair, Mr Fairley, and not first names, please. My apologies. Um, given the point that Mr Finlay, uh, Mr Carson has just raised with me, the points I have raised today remark upon real-world experience of farmers such as myself, and I look forward to the continuing work of this bill as it continues its path through Parliament, because I believe that the Government have got the tone right, and they will do the right uh, consultation, and this bill will do exactly what it says in the tin. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Fairley. I now call Mercedes Vialba to be followed by Ariane Bur Burgess again for around six minutes. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As a member of the Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Committee, let me begin by thanking the convener and the deputy convener for their facilitation of a robust series of scrutiny sessions of the Hunting with Dogs Scotland Bill and to the committee clerks for their detailed and thorough work throughout. I think it's fair to say that we knew from the outset that the bill would stimulate lively debate and I believe our stage one report reflects the diversity of views that we heard. Representing a large rural area as I do in the North East, I recognise that there are differing views as to whether the measures in this bill are proportionate in terms of their impact on the rural sector and if they go far enough in strengthening wildlife protection. Nevertheless, the principles of this bill are to be welcomed, which is why Scottish Labour will be backing it at stage one today. As a party, we have long been committed to strengthening wildlife protection law and to truly ending the practice of fox hunting in Scotland. This legislation marks a welcome step forward in this regard, and it's a testament to animal welfare campaigning organisations such as the League Against Cruel Sports, One Kind and Scottish Badgers, who have helped to secure some of the positive changes included in this bill. However, there are a number of limitations in the bill as drafted, which we would hope to see amended at stage two. No interventions. The Scottish Government has been clear that this bill seeks to address inconsistencies and ambiguities in the language contained in the 2002 Act, 
which often undermined attempts to investigate and prosecute alleged offences. Yet, as has been highlighted by the Law Society of Scotland, ambiguities remain in the Bill as drafted, as well as a lack of clarity around certain definitions and acts described in the Bill, the Law Society of Scotland also identifies the importance of clarifying language to improve both understanding and enforcement. They make a number of suggestions, such as clarifying what is meant by invasive non-native species by providing a list of common names of such species to be included in the Bill. I would urge the Scottish Government to address some of the ambiguous language currently in the Bill to strengthen understanding, interpretation and enforcement. And given that the Scottish Government's stated aim for the Bill is to achieve the highest possible animal welfare standards, it's also clear that the proposal to allow even one dog below ground undermines this. Animal welfare organisations highlighted to the Committee the difficulties in controlling a dog below ground increasing the likelihood of conflict between a dog and a wild mammal as a result. Such conflicts pose serious welfare risks to both animals. The Scottish Government has acknowledged the view that such practice is incompatible with the highest standards of animal welfare and has not sought to refute this, yet has chosen to retain the exception in the Bill for the use of one dog underground. The Scottish Government refers to this as balance but the Minister cannot have it both ways. She cannot compromise on cruelty in the same bill she claims will achieve the highest standards of animal welfare. No intervention. I also agree with animal welfare organisations who question why the bill permits the use of birds as a method of killing. It's not credible for the Scottish Government to suggest that the killing of an animal by a bird of prey rather than a dog is better from an animal welfare perspective. The Scottish Animal Welfare Commission told the committee in its evidence that, and I quote, the impact on the welfare of the hunted animal is likely to be similar whether killed by a dog or by a bird of prey. And while the bill will strengthen fox hunting laws, it will also introduce a licensing scheme which will allow hunting to continue in some circumstances. Under the proposed licensing scheme, packs of dogs could still be used. As a result, these packs of dogs would be exempt from the proposed two-dog limit. It's evidently a loophole which could be exploited by those looking to get around the rules and continue with hunts. Deputy Presiding Officer, as I've already stated, I welcome the principles underpinning the Bill of Strengthening Wildlife Protection and Animal Welfare. But the Bill evidently needs further changes to strengthen it, including addressing the ambiguity of some of the language used in it, which could undermine both interpretation and enforcement. As the Bill also fails to end the use of any dogs below ground, there continues to be welfare risks for both dogs and wild mammals. And the Bill should not permit the use of birds of prey as a method of killing. The proposed licensing scheme also has an inherent loophole which could be exploited by those looking to continue hunts. If the Scottish Government is unwilling to make the changes needed to this bill, Scottish Labour will introduce amendments ahead of stage two because failure to make these changes risks wasting the opportunity provided by this bill to deliver real and lasting changes to wildlife protection and animal welfare in Scotland. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Yalba. I now call Ariane Burgess to be followed by Alistair Allen for around six minutes, please, Ms. Burgess. Thank you. Presiding officer, with time to reflect during recess, I speak in this chamber at a time when a year from uh, a year ago we, are, we were facing COP26 and we are still deep in a climate and nature emergency and that is the unavoidable backdrop to everything we do in this parliament. That is the context we need to keep fully in our minds when shaping and scrutinising legislation and I can't fathom for the life of me why governments and parliaments around the world are not approaching this with the speed and focus with which we tackle the pandemic. Let's show the way. Let's act like it's a real emergency because it is. Turning to the hunting with dogs bill, let's start from the perspective of a wild animal, a fox. The terror of being chased relentlessly, breathlessly by 36 hounds, mm -hmm. something you haven't evolved to do. The desperation of finding your underground roots are blocked. The horror and agony of being torn limb from limb while still alive. Hunting wild mammals with packs of dogs is illegal, but continues in Scotland. In the borders, Lanarkshire, 
Renfrewshire, 10 hunts go out two to three times a week from November through March each and every year. On top of the hounds, there are, can be dozens of riders on horseback, plus terriers, all working together to prevent the animal's escape. This is not humane, and it is not justifiable. In rain committee and meetings with stakeholders, a question formed in my mind. Are we legislating for a Scotland of the past? Are we legislating for a Scotland of today? Or are we, as we should be, legislating for a future Scotland? 87% of the Scottish public and 100% of under 35s support a ban on fox hunting. And it's not just fox, foxes that need protection. Hares, Burgess, rabbits. Mr. Ms. Burgess, if you could resume your seat. Point of order, Rachel Hamilton. May I seek your advice, please, Presiding Officer? Ariane Burgess has just suggested that 10 packs um, of uh, hounds and the borders are breaking the law. Could I, could I seek your advice as to um, if that is competent within this chamber? Ms Hamilton, I think that was an intervention rather than a point of order. Um, Ms Burgess, please continue. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's not just foxes that need protection. Hares, rabbits, stoats, minks and badgers are also at ring risk of agonising death. The Scottish Greens are opposed to blood sports. Full stop. No, I'm not going to take any interventions. The Scottish Greens are opposed to blood stop sports. Full stop. And that's why they are excluded. There's an excluded area in the Butte House Agreement with the Scottish Government, so that we can push harder for more ambitious legislation that gives wild animals the protection and respect they need and deserve. But there are areas where we do agree, and I'm confident that there will be scope to work together with the government and other parties to strengthen this bill as it makes its way through Parliament. So the Greens will support the bill at stage one. However, to retain our support, it is essential that we close three loopholes in the legislation. It's already an offence to use a dog to chase and kill wild mammals, but exceptions in the current law act as loopholes, providing cover for illegal hunting to continue Loopholes such as training dogs to follow an animal scent or using dogs to flush out foxes for falconry. Make no mistake, if this bill establishes a licensing scheme for using more than two dogs, illegal hunting will persist. Instead, we must close off any loopholes, just like the hunts close off the foxes' escape routes. The Scottish Greens are not interested in licensing cruelty, so at stage two, I will lodge an amendment to remove the licensing scheme. A strict two-dog limit would put an end to illegal hunting with packs. Hunts won't want to go out with just two dogs, and if they do, it will be much easier for prosecutors to determine when the law is being broken. The evidence shows it is not necessary to use more than two dogs to manage wildlife or to achieve environmental benefit, as my colleague Jim Fairley just indicated. I understand and sympathise with farmers need to, their need to minimise the loss of lambs and other stock. A two-dog limit won't prevent farmers from protecting their livestock or crops, but it will encourage the use of more humane and effective stock management measures. The licensing isn't the only loophole in the legislation that needs closing. Second, the exception for management of foxes and mink below ground needs to be removed, as it provides a smokescreen for terrier work in fox hunts. Even if the aim is to flush the fox or the mink to kill it in a more humane way, sending terriers below ground too often results in underground, virtually a dogfight underground and, a hor and horrific injuries to the animals involved. The rain report questions whether the use of dogs at all below ground is compatible with the bill's pursuit of the highest possible animal welfare standards, and it is doubtful that it would ever align with the international ethical principles for wildlife control. Third, the loophole for using dogs in hunting for sport must be closed. There is no need to kill animals for sport. This is altogether different from killing them for food or to protect certain species, livestock, or biodiversity. 89% of people who support the bill object to this exception for falconry, game shooting, and deer stocking. We can't allow this to be another loophole for fox hunts, like in England, where hunts sometimes carry birds of prey as a token presence to circumvent the two-dog limit there. 
Greens support the intention of this bill to protect wild mammals from being chased and killed by packs of dogs, so we'll vote in favour of its general principles. However, there's no doubt that the legislation remains flawed and these three loopholes must be closed. I look forward to working with the Minister and members across the Chamber to achieve this and finally ban fox hunting in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms Burgess. Um, as a result of everybody sticking to their time limits and even accommodating uh, the uh, interventions within their time limits, we now have a little bit more time in hand. Um, so I think uh, my successor in the chair may be able to be a little bit more generous. And with that, I call Alistair Allen uh, to be followed by Donald Cameron. Thank you, Presiding Officer. If I may declare from the outset not so much an interest here as an objectivity, uh, my constituency, the Western Isles, has no native fox population. That is, with the exception of a single sighting some 14 years ago, which can only convincingly be explained as a fox if it was one which was either an exceptionally good swimmer or a very sly Calmac passenger. And I have tried to approach my role on the committee from that dispassionate starting point. Like others, uh, may I thank everyone involved in the Stage 1 report, including uh, all other committee members, our witnesses, those stakeholders who gave written evidence, and not least the committee clerks. It is important to remember that the aims of this bill uh, uh, grow out of a response to Lord Bonamy's report on the review of the Protection of Wild Mammals Scotland Act passed in 2002 uh, by producing better and less ambiguous legislation on the hunting of wild mammals. Doing so requires, in my view, considering two objectives, uh, preventing cruelty on the one hand and also recognising the legitimate needs for pest control which farmers and other land managers have on the other. Now, while inevitably not all will agree with the committee's findings in this stage one report, I believe the committee has taken balanced evidence on the many questions before it and uh, I must say has, has done so in more measured tones uh, than one or two of the contributions uh, uh, today uh, might suggest we have. Uh, this is undeniably both a difficult and a technical issue, and rather than engage with inevitably polarising articles of faith around the question of hunting with dogs, I believe the Committee's Stage 1 report is instead an effort to examine the facts. Not only does it seek to examine the Scottish Government's proposals, but it does, as others have mentioned, request uh, further information from the Government on points of the Bill where further information was, in the Committee's view, still needed. The Government has already responded to this call, which is very welcome, and the Government's response to the report will, I believe, help inform the Bill as it now goes forward. Presiding officer, a number of stakeholders have already commented that the Bill represents a significant clarification of the law. Most notably, perhaps, as I have alluded to in an earlier intervention, the author of the 2016 uh, review, Lord Bonamy, in giving evidence to the committee, said that he regarded the bill as a very well-crafted piece of legislation and an improvement on the existing law. He commented to us that the bill uh, solves the problems identified uh, about the loose and variable use of language. It makes everything much clearer and simpler, which in itself should be a great incentive for better enforcement of the law, because the police and the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service were struggling with the effective detection and prosecution of offenders. In the same evidence session, Dr Pete Goddard from the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission commented that there are some small points on which greater clarity and less confusion could be introduced, but in general it is moving towards questioning practices and looking for solutions that follow international ethical practices uh, for wildlife control. He said that they were very supportive of such moves. Now, the report also acknowledges, however, the views of a minority uh, on the committee uh, about various specific issues, such as the inclusion of rabbits within the definition of wild mammal and, and, on, and on whether the bill uh, could possibly create a liability for dog walkers where a dog chases uh, a wild mammal while being exercised. For my own part, incidentally, uh, I believe that the evidence we heard answered any questions about that last scenario very convincingly, a view that was shared by the majority of the committee. Other issues on which we took extensive evidence included the proposed two-dog limit, as others have discussed today, the licensing scheme, which would provide for exceptions to that, the introduction of deprivation orders, which would allow the courts uh, to intervene in relation to any dogs or horses used in an offence, allowing exceptions for the training of dogs, the use of dogs underground, 
uh, and the inclusion, as we've talked about, of, of rabbits within the terms of the bill, something which is, uh, as others have alluded to as well, intended to address the issue that those suspected of hair coursing frequently use uh, a cover, uh, as a cover the explanation that they are legally using dogs to hunt rabbits. To conclude, presiding off, I will, yes. I thank uh, Dr Allen for the, taking the intervention. Um, I was interested in the, in the scope of the committee, um, the argument that uh, using rabbits as a defence for hair coursing would allow, uh, well, nobody has said this, um, the number of prosecutions to increase for hair coursing. But I'm not sure if allowing that within the scope of this bill is strong enough, um, because so far there's been very few uh, police prosecutions for um, hair coursing. I thank uh, the member for, for raising that issue. My, my recollection is from, from the evidence given to us by um, the police that they would, would certainly welcome uh, measures which would uh, uh, address this issue of, of, in, of individuals uh, using, hair, using uh, the excuse of, of hunting rabbits uh, as a cover for uh, illegal hair coursing. Uh, and I certainly think that that is a, a, sensible, uh, a sensible measure that the bill seeks to, to bring forward. Um, to conclude, Presiding Officer, uh, in our Stage 1 report, we have as a committee been able uh, to recommend that the Parliament approve the general principles of this Bill. That has not uh, perhaps always been emphasised in the course of this debate, so let me emphasise it now. Uh, the committee report recommends that we, as a Parliament, approve the general principles of this Bill. Uh, and that, Presiding Officer, is something which I hope Parliament will now be able to do. Thank you. I call Donald Cameron to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I uh, direct members to my register of interest in relation to uh, owning a landholding in the Highland Council region? Um, from the outset, I want to state that um, we want to see on these benches the highest animal welfare standards and a robustness in dealing with those who intentionally flout the law or put the lives of wild animals at risk for no reason. However, it is clear from the significant correspondence that I have received, and I'm sure other members in the chamber have received from our constituents, that this bill could have unintended consequences, and many people are worried. Emails have come from concerned farmers, crofters, and other land managers who believe that the bill in its current form is too restrictive due to its limitations, and that the proposed licensing scheme um, will create problems in terms of pest and predator control. And these emails have come from constituents of mine who live in rural communities across the Highlands and Islands. And they feel that while the principles behind the bill are sound, the manner in which the government has presented it will do more harm than good. And I share these concerns. And while uh, we will support the principles of the bill today, we believe on these benches that significant changes are needed before the bill comes back to secure our support. Can I also point out that of the 1,300 consultation comments on the bill, almost two-thirds of those comments were against it. And I'd like to focus on some of those issues today. And the central point of concern is the proposed licensing scheme um, contained within the bill. Uh, members will be aware of what the bill states in this regard. And there are worries about the workability of this scheme. And the suggested reforms include the need for licenses to be granted to groups of farmers and landowners, for licenses to be issued for livestock protection on any 14 days in a year, rather than in one 14-day block, and for licenses to be issued where the use of dogs will make a significant contribution to the prevention of serious damage to livestock or to the natural environment. And the Scottish Conservatives are sympathetic to these uh, requests for changes, and I would urge the government and the Minister to consider them carefully. And on the matter of the 14-day licence, um, it's our belief that the existing proposal should be reviewed and altered, and particularly that the time period is too restrictive and it is not long enough to cover periods when pest control is needed, as Lord Bonamy himself found. I, I note uh, from the uh, RAIN Committee Stage 1 report that the Minister has indicated she'd be open to, uh, to, to look at the time period if it is seen not to be workable. And given that issue has been raised by some members and our external stakeholders, I hope the Scottish Government will consider amending this. Uh, more broadly, the committee report also notes the lack of clarity about the details of the licensing scheme. And they've asked the Scottish Government for more information. And 
Disappointingly, we do not have that uh, information. And I think it, it has been said that the, uh, the detail cannot be provided until after stage three. Now, I think that is simply unacceptable. And I would urge the government to at least give some detail about what form the licensing scheme will take. If the government is pinning this bill on a licensing system, then you have to give some indication as to what that licensing scheme will look like. Yes. Minister. Just to clarify on the point about the detail of the licensing scheme, I mean, I would refer the member to section 8 and to section uh, 5, sorry, 6 of the bill, which actually sets out a huge amount of detail of what's going to be included in the licensing scheme. What I'm saying is I can't complete the accompanying guidance until the bill is in its final form. That's a reasonable position, surely. Donald Cameron. I don't think it is a reasonable position, with respect. You need the guidance to explain to explain the scheme. How else, how else will stakeholders be, be um, uh, allowed or expected to, to implement it or to, to, or to try and qualify under it? Um, it's completely unreasonable. And in many ways, this is one of the reasons why a licensing scheme wasn't included in the 2002 Act. Lord Bonamy himself stated, it is not clear, and I quote, that establishing a formal system of licensing would do more for the protection of wild mammals than amending the legislation would and that the bureaucracy and expense involved are unlikely to be adequately reflected in resultant benefit. Well, precisely. Uh, can I touch briefly on the issue of the two dog restriction? Um, the Scottish Conservatives believe that it is right that pest control using dogs is a regulated activity, uh, but we note that various stakeholders have raised concerns about the implications of that specific uh, restriction. Scottish land and the States have argued that dog limits would make fox and pest control almost impossible and would have a negative impact on ground nesting birds. And the Scottish Gamekeepers Association, already referred to by others, have argued uh, that th that may result in the limiting of effectiveness of dog packs and a loss of revenue and limitations and operating, meaning owners uh, would have to um, uh, uh, put their dogs down. I listened with great interest to Jim Fairley's comments on, uh, the, uh, on his experience of using two dogs in a, in a wood. Uh, I have no reason to doubt that. But I have also seen um, hill, uh, hill packs of more than two dogs uh, operating in, in the West Highlands in Forestry Commission Woodland, where the only way of doing this effectively is to have more than two dogs on steep areas of ground in, covering large areas of woodland, for example. It is the only way to do it humanely uh, and effectively. Um, the Scottish Government has said that it believes the two dog limit is workable, reasonable and appropriate. But it is clear from what stakeholders uh, have indicated in the comments from other members that this won't always be the case, and I urge the Minister to reflect on that. In closing, Presiding Officer, uh, we want this bill to improve animal welfare while maintaining effective, practical methods of pest control. It is clear that uh, there are many worries about uh, the current proposals, and I'm encouraged that the Government has recognised this, and we will work constructively with them to improve it. But our farmers, our crofters, our land managers are the custodians of our countryside, and it is right that we pass legislation that helps them do their job rather than hinders them. Thank you, President. Thank you. I call Christine Graham, the final speaker in the open debate. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I preface this by saying I'm using my surface for the first time to speak from, so if it all falls apart, so will I. Uh, Presiding Officer, and not a member of the committee, I'm pleased to rise and speak in this debate and thank the committee and all witnesses, whatever their position on this bill, for their evidence which has led to this considered report. I also note the Scottish Government response. I further add that I support the general principles of the bill, but some general comments. A quote from the Minister at stage one. Quote, I've tried to strike a balance between closing down loopholes and the need for effective protection of livestock and wildlife from predation. I think the Minister is doing well in trying to strike that very difficult balance when there are undoubtedly ingrained and genuine views on the edges of this debate. I note Jim Fairley's contribution, which I welcome and listen to with interest. We have debated this privately often. The comment from Lord Bonamy, who chaired the review of the Protection of Wild Mammals Scotland Bill, which incidentally was a Members' Bill brought in in the early days of this Parliament by Trish Marwick and Mike Watson, if I recall, it meant well, and I supported it, but it was flawed, as the years have demonstrated. So back to Lord Bonamy. 
and it's been quoted already, but it's worth saying again, <laughs> practically of any legislation, if MD says this, quotes, it solves the problems of the loose and variable use of language in that original act. Quotes, should be a real incentive for better enforcement of the law. Endorsements well worth, as I say, any piece of legislation. I think another useful quotation of the report is from animal welfare organisations. This is an opportunity to rethink the solutions to the problem of wild animal predations and agricultural land, and we need to do more of this. I think it must be a collective effort. I agree, and I think there are opportunities to make improvements subject to the licensing scheme, which I'll come to in a moment, uh, and the amendments which lie ahead. Where we are now is at last eliminating, so far as is legally possible, the use of dogs predating on wild mammals for sport. Sport which was sometimes and often, I would say, used in the guise of pest control. That's gone. So broadly, we have the use of two dogs above ground and one below. This is with a view to preventing, as I understand it, pack behaviour to ensure control and to ensure this is as a last resort the swift and humane dispatch of the mammal. I emphasise as that last resort after other measures have failed. Turning now to scent trails, which will be banned except for individual dog, most two dogs for training purposes, such as police dogs and so on. In England and Wales, experience I understand has demonstrated that this has developed as frankly a means of continuing hunting foxes with packs. The 2002 Act was flouted not just as we know through criminal prosecutions, but I also saw this in myself, and I say to Donald Cameron, <laughs> on a dark rainy day some years back, I came across quite unexpectedly in the middle of the border hills, folk on quad bikes, headlights blazing, careering downwards as they followed the pack of hounds. And I saw for myself what a pack does to an exhausted animal, tearing it to shreds, strewn across the hillsides, and the parts of the animal, whatever it was, being retrieved by the people on the bikes. There was nothing humane in that, and no one would be out in the wilds and weather policing that, and I saw it just by chance. So this ban on both scent trials and hunting with packs is to be welcomed. Yes, I will. Rachel Hamilton. Uh, well, I was just about to say to Christine Graham, obviously that's, that's an illegal activity that you witnessed. Did you report it to the police, and on which day was it? You're, you're, you're asking me for the day I said some years back. It actually was my son's birthday, so I should be able to remember. It was January the 14th some years back. But the other issue I have is I couldn't identify the people because when they saw me there, there was a row of Land Rovers watching it. And when they saw me, t I just accidentally there, they soon scooted up, up the hill and disappeared. So it was impossible to actually identify the people. But it did happen, I say to Ms Hamilton. It did happen, and it shocked me. And it shocked me that, to me, it was being done in a surreptitious manner in the middle of nowhere on a day when nobody would be about except the people following the hunt and, ha and me by chance. Now, I want to go on to rabbits. Now, rabbits, repeat, are including, because we keep going on about the rabbits, as the hunting of those, as the police have said, was a device and provided an alibi for hair coursing. And without repeating the quotes I gave to the convener of the committee, both Police Scotland and the Procurator Fiscal supported this as it would assist in hair-coursing prosecutions. And this is all about having law which is detailed and effective. So there are also other more humane methods of rabbit control. Yes, I will. Yeah, Carson. There's absolutely no doubt uh, that everybody here wants to do all they can to prevent hair-coursing. But it's a lazy option to include rabbits because there's no suggestion there's any welfare issues surrounding rough shooting to shoot rabbits. Uh, the, the police and the procurator actually were surprised when we raised that issue and actually did question whether it was a, 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 a sledgehammer to crack or not. So can you tell me what other steps this bill takes to help address hair coursing? We have time in well, hand. I will give Ms Graham her time Thank back. you very much. The other steps are opposed to two dogs and all the other things that are within the Act that apply to all male mammals. But if you want to suggest that Police Scotland have got this wrong and it doesn't give them more evidence, please take it up with them at your committee. Turning to the exception to the exception and the crucial proposed licensing scheme, and I note the Minister's response in that this must await the Bill moving through its amendment stages, but I am compromising so far regarding the licensing regime, the details of which are crucial. 
And I'm pleased that Nature Scotland, the Scottish Government and all stakeholders, which will of course include farmers and gamekeepers, many of whom I meet or for whom I have high regard, will be fully engaged in this. And I think this detail is extremely important if some of us in this chamber, like myself, are compromising by even accepting a licensing scheme. I am prepared to go that far, but I need to see the details of licensing that will not be abused. The Minister says this will be a high bar, and if it is to proceed, so it must be, and I am reserving my view on that until they are published. I also state to my colleague Rachel Hamilton, she kind of made me feel a bit angry, I need no lessons in representing my rural constituency, which I have done now for the last 23 years, more than she has done. I will therefore be following the next stages with interest. Thank you. We move to closing speeches, and I call on Colin Smith. Up to six minutes, please. I should say that we do have time in hand for some interventions. Uh, and I'm sure there will be very many every time I get up to speak, uh, presiding officer. Uh, th thank you. Today's debate has uh, shown why this bill is not only needed, but I have to say is long overdue. And I do welcome the fact that there is a consensus to support the principles of the bill. But it's also clear from the debate that, that not only is ending hunting with packs of dogs unfinished business, the bill itself is very much unfinished business. We need to deliver a better bill than the one that is before us, one that is effective and one that does not seek to close existing loopholes by creating new ones, such as a licensing scheme. It is very clear from the debate that those who oppose the, the two-dog limit do so not because they believe you should license the use of more than two dogs in, in certain circumstances. They actually believe in using more than two dogs in all circumstances, and I think they will seek to bulldoze through the two-dog limit by using a licensing scheme. The position is, and the Scottish Countryside Alliance said in their written evidence to the RAIN Committee, and I quote, if fox control is to be effective in Scotland, a restriction to two dogs would make that impossible. I will take an intervention on that. Finlay Carson. I thank Mr Smith for taking the intervention. First, first put on record, I, I take it very offensively, and I am sure everybody on these Conservative benches that we do not hold animal welfare standards uh, in, in high regard, and that is what we want to achieve through this bill. However, will you admit that we heard evidence that, in many circumstances, the limiting uh, of the number of dogs to two could actually increase the potential for uh, animal welfare issues uh, through prolonged chase uh, and, and, and the potential for those dogs actually to, to catch a fox or whatever? So there are circumstances where two dogs would make animal welfare uh, less acceptable or the, or the issues that uh, they face. I, I, I have to say, I think Finlay Carson gives the game away. He said very clearly that he opposes a limit of two dogs, and I think that, that reiterates the Scottish Countryside Alliance view that they oppose a limit of two dogs. Not that they want a licence scheme, uh, they actually do not want a limit of two dogs. Now, I do not agree with that position, and the committee were provided with numerous examples illustrating that wild mammals can be controlled effectively using two dogs. But it is nonetheless a clear position that Finlay Carson has and, and others like the Scottish Countryside Alliance have as well. But what isn't clear, what is utterly contradictory, I have to say, is the government's position to say that on the one hand they want to limit the number of dogs to two for animal welfare reasons, but on the other hand disregard the animal welfare considerations by issuing a licence for the use of more than two dogs without defining the criteria for that licence at all. Now, the Minister herself said to the committee on the 29th of June, and I quote, the two-dog limit is based on the fact that it will, be substan it will substantially reduce the ability to chase and kill. I agree, but the Minister ignores her own words by continuing to allow the use of packs of dogs. The Minister told com the committee that the most important element of licensing was for the dogs to be under control. But as the SSPCA said in their evidence, and I quote, keeping a dog under control that has been trained to go for a scent or to attack an animal is, unless you physically restrain it, damn near impossible. Uh, oh, certainly will, yeah. Minister. Can I just uh, probe the member on his thoughts about why he thinks it is acceptable to ignore the comments of the senior Scottish judge, Lord Bonamy, who looked into this, who said there is certain terrain on which two dogs would not allow a farmer, a land manager or an environmentalist to carry out a lawful activity of flushing an animal to waiting control. 
Colin Smith. Because the reality is that Lord Bonamy was not asked to look at the animal welfare issues. He was asked to look at the effectiveness of the existing bill and the implementation. He was not asked to look at the animal welfare issues. And I believe that animal welfare issues should be prominent in this bill. And that's obviously a difference between myself and the Minister. And Lord Bonamy wasn't asked to look at those animal welfare issues at all. And the Minister told if I've got time, President Officer, I can certainly do that. You do indeed. Rachel Hamilton. A little bit for, for members, because Bonamy actually said the licensing scheme is, I think, what makes it viable to have the two-dog limit. There must be circumstances in which people can justify that it is appropriate to have more dogs and licensing will allow for that. So let's stop arguing about what Bonamy said, because that is what he said. Colin Smith. Uh, several members are, are, are used to obviously uh, quoting Lord Bonamy. Let me just tell you what Donald Cameron just said that Lord Bonamy said about the licensing scheme. He said it's not clear, this is Lord Bonamy, that establishing a formal licensing would do more for the protection of wild animals than amending the legislation. The same difficulties of proof and enforcement remain. That was Lord Bonamy's uh, quote uh, uh, that Donald Cameron said. He didn't he didn't give a result. And if Finlay Castle wants to make an invention, he can do so, or he can keep Shilton from a sedentary position. It's entirely up to him. But we can keep going back and forward about quotes from Lord Bonamy. But what is absolutely clear is that Lord Bonamy was not asked to look at the animal welfare issues. And it's absolutely clear from the evidence that the ability to chase and kill a fox has increased by using a pack of dogs far more than it is by limiting that to two dogs. I'll let Finlay Castle have another intervention if we've got time. It's, it's my belief that the, the licensing that uh, Donald Cameron was referring to was not with regards to a two-dog limit. So the licensing is absolutely crucial when there's a two-dog limit. Yeah. So we're, we're talking about different things here. Yeah. Colin Smith. And he was absolutely clear that licensing would still bring the same difficulties of proof and enforcement with a pack of dogs. That doesn't change just because you have a license in your pocket, Mr Carson. Now, the minister stated to the, the committee... And following the evidence, that I, and back to the issue of how you actually restrain a pack of dogs, the Minister said, and I quote, I think it's self-evident that it's easier to keep control of a small number of dogs than a larger pack of dogs. Two is also the maximum number of dogs permitted in England and Wales, something that Conservative members seem to have managed to forget about today. But, President Officer, the Minister is saying one thing, but this bill does another. And who would have thought that the current UK Government were more progressive in fox hunting than the Scottish Government was when it comes to a limitation on the number of dogs? Now, Ariana Burgess uh, says she supports, and the Green position is to support Labour's position uh, against licensing. But the, the problem is that the SNP Green Government is proposing a bill that includes licensing because of the Green Party's decision to opt out of field sports and animal welfare when it came to that particular Butte House agreement. As a result of that, the SNP have been given a free pass to ignore Ariana Burgess's views and the Green Party views. And that, I have to say, is disappointing that why animal welfare wasn't given a far higher prominence. So, President Officer, I repeat what I said in my opening speech. Labour will bring forward an amendment to remove licensing. And if others vote uh, to continue the use of more dogs, one of the things that has been suggested by the government's own Scottish Animal Welfare Commission and groups such as One Kind is that the international consensus principles for ethical wildlife control should be used to guide decision making on any license. One of the big issues raised by a number of members is the lack of detail, the lack of criteria for any particular license scheme. That's why many people are incredibly sceptical of its inclusion. Now, five months ago, I brought a members' debate to this chamber calling for Scotland to lead the way in how we deal with wildlife intervention by incorporating those seven principles in law to embed them into Scottish Government and societal practice of wildlife management. The, the member must conclude now. Um, wildlife management principles are currently not being met. Sorry. Which of the current ethical wildlife principle management, um, whatever they're called, principles of wildlife ethical management, are not currently being met? I think it's absolutely clear to me that, in the circumstances, it is not the issue that minimises the impact on animal welfare by using a, 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 a pack of dogs far more than it is if you were limiting that to, to two dogs. I think it's very clear in that area that it wouldn't be um, it wouldn't be compatible with those ethical principles. And the government themselves say that they are, and Nature Scott say themselves, that they are very much aligned to those particular principles when it does come to what the licensing scheme will see. Well, the test of this will be whether or not the government are prepared to incorporate those principles in 
to the bill. Uh, if you could conclude, please, Mr Smith. I certainly will, President Officer. There are numerous issues, I think, that have been highlighted on why this bill is very much unfinished business. Labour will work with the government to see if we can maximise the importance of animal welfare on that bill, but we won't support a bill that continues to try to close some loopholes by creating other loopholes that increase the impact on animal welfare. Thanks, President Officer. Thank you. I call on Liz Smith. Up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. This uh, Stage 1 debate is an important one. Uh, because of its implications for improving animal welfare for the rural sector and for the best management of wildlife across Scotland. So there's very little surprise that a wide variety of stakeholder groups have been expressing their views to MSPs over these past few months, and little surprise that opinion is sharply divided over the merits of the bill. Uh, Jim Fairley, uh, I can't uh, compete in terms of his professional expertise, but I have been interested in this bill because in Perthshire I live amongst communities which would be directly affected by the bill. Communities, I want to stress at the outset, who want to see the highest standards of animal welfare adopted everywhere. They want good land management which safeguards that welfare, but which also enhances our countryside and pre preserves the jobs and the livelihoods connected to it. And despite what uh, Mr Smith might allege, I wholeheartedly, and so do my colleagues, support them in these aspirations. So the main challenge of this bill, as I see it, is to deliver at the same time better animal welfare and protect the best interests of the rural economy yeah. and all those who live and work in it. Yeah. That challenge is tough, but we will succeed if we deliver the crucial amendments to this bill as it currently stands. In other words, we have to deliver good law. Now, good law, if I can remind the Parliament from previous debates in this chamber, is the basis for effective legislation, and as such, it requires the following. A clarity of purpose, to be strong in its evidence base, to be workable, to be accepted by the public, and to be understood in simple language. And on this last point, this bill, as currently drafted, has run into some trouble, despite the best intentions to resolve matters with the 2002 Act, which was deemed to include too many inconsistencies and ambiguities. The deliberations of the RAIN Committee, when discussing this issue with the Minister, made very clear that difficulties about language and the intended meaning remain. And we have seen examples from previous legislation passed in this Parliament what happens when inconsistencies and ambiguities remain. So, yes, of course. Minister. Can I ju uh, just uh, query of Liz Smith whether, given what she says, she disagrees with Lord Bonamy's quote, which has been used a number of times this afternoon, that this bill is very well crafted piece of legislation which solves the problems that he identified about loose and variable language. That seems to contradict Liz Smith's contribution. Liz I, Smith. I, I entirely accept what Lord Bonamy has said. That the committee Minister is asking for specific commitments to improve this bill in terms of its language and to ensure that we don't have any of the ambiguities and the inconsistencies remaining. And I note with regard to that, the RAIN Committee has also made a very specific uh, request that the Scottish Government should provide additional information about the licensing. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's true that you have provided some. But as Christine Graham rightly pointed out, there isn't sufficient evidence within that uh, to ensure that we're moving in the right direction. And again, I come back to previous legislation in this Parliament. I know exactly what has happened when the uh, information that underpins a bill has not been as precise as it should have been, because it ends up in bad law. And that is something that we have to avoid. Now, no one, no one doubts for a minute that crimes remain within the countryside because, as Rachel Hamilton put it in committee, there is a small minority of malevolent individuals operating in our countryside. They are determined to break the law and uh, kill or maim animals, and it is vitally important that these crimes are detected and the perpetrators prosecuted. But it is just as important that the law is clear. Both Finlay Carson and Jim Fairley raised questions at committee, citing scenarios where, unless the law was clarified, there would be doubt in people's minds as to how they should stay on the right side of the law, because the definition of intent was unclear and that couldn't be measured, and I agree with them on that point. Now, we come to this issue about rabbits being included in the definition of mammals, and it's important. No one doubts 
the Minister's intentions to address illegal hair coursing, as we all do. But by including rabbits in the definition, there will clearly be unintended consequences on rough shoots and uh, on um, various trials like kennel clubs, because the inclusion of rabbits as mammals, it might sound very good in theory, in fact it does sound very good in theory, but the practice tells a different story. And so we ask the Scottish Government again to look at this. Now let me come to this second big issue about licensing. Any licensing system must be both understood and workable so that it can be fair and practical for farmers and land managers to protect their livestock, their livelihoods and species like nesting birds. Rachel Hamilton mentioned the caper Cayley. Because failure to, project, to, to manage the predators uh, and indeed undermine uh, the control toolbox appropriately has real life consequences for our wildlife. And it's very clear from what many stakeholders are saying that there are concerns about how effective pest control can be managed in some circumstances with just two dogs. In fact, Lord Bonamy himself said that in some instances that is impractical. And there are very serious concerns about how flexible uh, the proposals are, because at the moment there are far too many stakeholders who are telling us that that is just not the case. Now, at the end, at the end of the day, this bill remains controversial. Nine major organisations supporting the bill, ten major organisations opposing it. And that's not mentioning the hundreds of individuals who've expressed their views to us as MSPs. Again, heavily divided. There are far too many unanswered questions and too little evidence to underpin the bill, which, although not intended, leaves the rural sector heavily exposed yet again, and which is why there are so many unhappy stakeholders. Presiding officer, the balance is surely to permit legitimate predation control by dogs and to improve animal welfare. But as yet, this bill does not have that correct balance. Thank you. I call on Mary McAllen to wind up. Um, Minister, up to 20 past. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I would like to uh, begin my closing remarks just by reflecting again on what I believe is a comprehensive set of legal requirements provided by this bill. And I would just like to look, first of all, at the offences, because we haven't actually done that today. These include the offence of hunting a wild mammal using a dog, as a landowner to knowingly cause or permit another to hunt on land that you own, and as a dog owner to knowingly cause or permit another to hunt using a dog that you own or are responsible for. These are three robust offences, and all of them carry three uh, sorry, carry robust penalties. And where there are exceptions to the offence, these are available only for defined purposes and separately with statutory conditions. And just to take the example of Section 3, which is the exception for management of wild animals above ground, this is available for the purpose of preventing serious damage to livestock, woodland or crops, preventing the spread of disease and protecting human health. And I hope the Chamber will accept that these are important purposes. But of course, despite being important purposes, the Bill goes on to require conditions on their exercise, namely, and again in the, the case of Section 3, um, that there will only be two yacht dogs used or more via the licensing scheme uh, where no other option exists, that any dog used is under control. This is a really important provision because it puts a strong onus on anyone who would purport to use a dog in the countryside. And of course, whether a dog is under control or not uh, should be readily identifiable. It requires that the dogs do not join with others to form a pack, again, a readily visible and identifiable issue when not complied with and that the permission of the landowner has been obtained and that the animal being flushed is dispatched as soon as reasonably practicable. This, this one example, with uh, that these defined purposes and with robust conditions, I believe allows me to strongly refute any suggestion that this bill does not prevent, present a comprehensive ban on illegal hunting. Now, having set that out, I'd like to move on to the interaction between the two-dog limit and the licensing scheme, which has dominated much of the discussion today. Yes, I will. Russell Finlay. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for taking the intervention. An earlier speaker, if I heard her correctly, made a serious and somewhat sweeping allegation that ten groups in Scotland routinely break the law by hunting with dogs. 
Is the Minister aware of any evidence to support this claim? Minister. Uh, Presiding officer, I, with all due respect to the member, am not here to speak to the contributions that have been made by members in the chamber. I can't even recall which member made that contribution. I think Rachel Hamilton raised a point of order at the time and she was told it wasn't one. It's not something I'm concerned with responding to, but thank you for, uh, thank you for your contribution. Um, but as I said, I wanted to talk about the more important issue of the interaction between the two-dog limit and the licensing scheme. I'm confident that the two-dog limit is the right approach. I'm confident of that because the majority of wildlife in Scotland already does not use dogs, uh, because where dogs are used, in some instances, two is already uh, the, the, the number that are generally used, including in deer stalking and with invasive non-native species. And finally, because it's already been instituted in England and Wales, and that has been remarked upon. However, Lord Bonamy was clear that there are certain terrain where control needs to be carried out, but where two dogs would not allow individuals to successfully carry out that legal activity of flushing wildlife as part of legitimate control. Um, and I believe that in this parliament, we have to guard against, uh, as we take action to end illegal activity, uh, we have to guard against impinging on lawful and legitimate activity, which is undertaken for a range of reasons throughout our rural country. Um, and the two dog limit, together with that narrowly defined but practical and available where necessary licensing scheme, uh, I believe achieves that. Yeah, happy to. Colin Smith. Does the Minister accept, though, that, that, that when she said uh, to the committee a licence to be construed as the option that's available when there are no other options, that the, the difficulty people have is that the government hasn't really set out what that actually means in, in practice. So one of the options that's been proposed is that we incorporate in this bill those ethical principles that I've talked about uh, on several occasions as effectively the guide towards what would be used in any licence scheme, notwithstanding I don't support a licence scheme. Rachel Hamilton raised the point that in what way would a licence not meet those ethical uh, principles? It's not the scheme itself, it would be the individual application that would have to be consistent with those ethical principles. Surely that's one way to set out in legislation uh, and to deal with the concerns that people have, that there is a lack of detail as the bill currently stands. Minister. I thank the member for the intervention. I've already said, I think, in the chamber, in the, the um, premise of another debate, that I'm interested in the ethical principles and the way that they can be applied to the various pieces of wildlife legislation and work that the government's undertaking, and that is no different with the Hunting with Dogs Bill, so I'm considering their application. Um, but just coming back to that point about the two-dog limit and the licensing scheme interaction, some have called for more liberal terms for the scheme to ensure that it will rise to what they see as an essential purpose while others have called for no licensing scheme uh, at all. Um, some members have been clear that the licensing scheme, in their view, is essential to operate effectively in certain circumstances. And what I would say to that is that the scheme is designed to operate on an extraordinary basis. Therefore, where it is truly essential, it will be available. Where it is not essential, where two dogs or another method of control would work, the licensing scheme will not be essential. And if I can talk about the content of the scheme, there's been a bit of a myth arising this afternoon that there is no detail available. I'd like to clarify that. Sections four and eight of the bill point to a series of um, criteria that, must be, that will be met as part of the framework for the licensing scheme. It speaks to uh, the, the particular species of animal having to be confirmed, that it will have to be granted to a particular person, and it sets out the test that would have to be made. I feel like I'm just about to address the point that Finlay Carson might raise, but I'll give him the opportunity anyway. Finlay Carson. Yeah, my, my question is, is, again, about licensing. Um, are you um, uh, going to be bringing forward amendments which will address some of the worries and concerns that stakeholders have got about 14-day limits and whatever, and will that be on the face of the bill, or are we going to have to wait until the bill is passed mm -hmm. uh, at stage three for you to Good come point. forward with uh, details? Minister. I struggle to see how amendments to primary legislation could be brought after stage three, so I'm not sure what Mr Carson is referring to. However, the 14-day licence period is on the face of the bill, so if that were to be amended, it would have to be via the parliamentary process. I hope that clarifies it. Um, now, I have already said, however, that we can't finalise that uh, accompanying guidance until the, the final form of the bill is, is known. Maybe that's what uh, Mr Carson is uh, referring to. But I commit to continuing engagement, to raising awareness of the requirements. I feel I'm running a little bit out of time, presiding officer. We have 
We have until 20 past, Minister. OK, go ahead. Thank Rachel you. Rachel Hamilton. Can I ask the Minister if the accompanying guidance is, are the details? Minister. Sorry, I, I don't understand that question. The, the accompanying Hamilton. guidance, everybody's looking for more clarity, more yeah. detail on the licensing scheme. You've said that you'll uh, uh, publish accompanying guidance. What is the accompanying guidance if it's not the detail? And why is it so late? Minister. Okay, f first of all, for Rachel Hamilton's benefit, it isn't late. This is a very standard approach to developing accompanying guidance. You cannot develop the guidance to accompany a statutory regime until the final form of the statute is known. That makes perfect sense. However, I was about to go on to say that Mr Carson, when he was responding on behalf of the committee, asked for oral updates to the committee on this. I am more than happy to do that. I have no concern whatsoever with keeping the committee, with keeping stakeholders engaged with the development of the guidance. Um, so, having, having covered that, um, I'd like to refer to the members who would like to see no licensing scheme at all in this bill. Now, I am, of course, open to hearing views from them, as I have been throughout, and uh, indeed of any member or group who wish to raise them with me. Uh, but I do have to ask, as I think I did with Colin Smith earlier, why those members would think it acceptable to ignore the findings of Lord Bonamy and the comments specifically that minister, he made. Minister, if you could just give me one moment, please. Members, I would be grateful if we could hear the Minister. Thank you. Please continue. Thank you, President Officer. Um, yet, uh, why they think they could ignore Bonamy, Lord Bonamy's findings on terrain, and I suppose how they would explain to hill farmers whose lambs on hill ground, where lamping is not possible, where enclose, enclosure isn't possible, why they would simply have to be allowed to be predated on, or to environmental groups who need more than two dogs to successfully deal with invasive non-native species as they are doing on Orkney, as they are doing on Uist, um, you would be saying to them that even in tightly restricted circumstances, the option of more dogs wasn't available. I, I don't think that's reasonable. So I would ask them to remember uh, that the bill provides for a licensing scheme only where no other option exists, and that for that tightly defined circumstance, it will be overseen by Nature Scott. And as we all consider the ban, the two-dog limit and the exceptional licensing scheme, I'd ask members to reflect, as has been uh, done a number of times this afternoon, on Lord Bonamy's evidence, where he said the licensing scheme is, I think, what makes it viable to have the two-dog limit. There must be circumstances in which people can justify that it's appropriate to have more dogs, and the licensing scheme will allow that. And importantly, he went on to say that the idea of keeping licences restricted is also a good one, and I intend to do that. Um, so, if I can, if I have time, I'll just briefly touch on a, a couple of other issues that were uh, mentioned. Firstly, I'm not sure Rachel Hamilton could substantiate her claim that I don't understand rural Scotland, or indeed that the man behind me doesn't, or a, a lot of the men and women behind me, but I'll leave her to consider that. The Minister cannot take an intervention you, as we are officer. concluding the um, debate. Very briefly, I will confirm to Breitra Swisher that my officials spoke with Police Scotland, uh, their dog handlers, after the committee session and were content that the bill will not negatively impact on how they train their dogs. Um, and I will consider the points about dogs underground. I think the points have been very well made. The Tories seem very concerned about the inclusion of rabbits within protection. I believe it's right to protect rabbits, as we do hares, from being chased and killed by dogs, and I'll continue uh, to defend that. Um, presiding officer, time is against me, but just to conclude, the chasing and killing of a wild mammal with a dog, for sport or, for, or otherwise, has no place in modern Scotland. This hunting with dogs bill uh, will finish the work that was started 20 years ago by delivering a comprehensive ban. By introducing this bill, I want to both close loopholes of the past, which have allowed an unlawful activity to persist, but also take action to prevent others from opening. I'm doing that in pursuit of the highest possible animal welfare standards, whilst recognising that we're a rural nation and that we must have access to legitimate control methods. Uh, so the bill has been designed to balance those needs of the lawful operation in our countryside with my determination and the government's determination to once and for all end illegal hunting. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes this stage one debate on Hunting with Dogs Scotland Bill. It is now time to move on to the next item of business, and there is one question to be put as a result of today's business. 
The question is that motion 6428 in the name of Mary McAllen on Hunting with Dogs Scotland Bill at Stage 1 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, um, I've been notified of a um, no vote online. The Parliament therefore is not agreed and we will move to a vote. There will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.